Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Once again, the threat of COVID is lurking over the horizon. This time because a new variant, JN.1, has surfaced and it is spreading slowly but effectively in Europe, much faster in Singapore, and it's also emerged in India. As of Wednesday, India has 21 cases of JN.1. And that raises the critical question, is this a matter of concern? Or given the experience we've been through with COVID in the last two, three years, should we be not over anxious? Should we not overreact? Joining me to answer those questions is one of our top virologists, professor of virology and a senior fellow at the Green Templeton College in Oxford University, Professor Shahid Jamil. Professor Jamil, I want to focus this interview on the COVID strain called JN.1, which I believe is a sub-lineage of BA.2.86, which has created a surge through many countries of Europe, in particular in Singapore and in India. According to the health ministry, we have 21 cases. In fact, just so the audience knows, we have a total of just over 2,300 overall COVID cases and 16 COVID deaths, according to the newspapers this morning. Those deaths have happened in the last two weeks. The WHO has called JN.1 a variant of interest. Before I come to details, and I will come to them in a moment's time, let me ask you for your broad overall opinion. Is this a matter of concern? Or given what we've been through in the last two, three years with COVID, would that be a mistaken response at this point? Oh, Karan, I would say that it's not a matter of concern, but it's certainly a matter of caution. Uh, and that's how we should deal with it. Uh, we should not get overly anxious. We should ensure that our systems are ready. And one of the things that people largely forget is while it's natural for memories of April 2021, the Delta variant, uh, you know, sort of scaring us off. But that was a very different time from what we have now uh, in terms of vaccination, in terms of infections that have already happened, and in terms of the variant itself. Uh, so I would again say, not a matter of concern, but certainly a matter of question. Before I come to details, let me quote what the WHO, that's the World Health Organization, said just a couple of days ago. I'm quoting them. Based on the available evidence, the additional public global health risk posed by JN.1 is currently evaluated at low. Would you agree with that? Yes, I do agree with that. I do agree with that. And uh, I will again say what I said earlier. When we moved from the wild type strain to the alpha, to the delta, to the Omicron, they were completely different variants. What people are not seeing is that JN.1 is simply a sublineage of Omicron. So it's not a quantum jump, as we would say, from you know, one drastically different variant to the other. This is just a little, you know, blip uh, on the same Omicron 
background. So I, I think a lot of the concern that's there now uh, is, a, is a bit misplaced. I'll repeat that sentence of yours because I think for the audience it will be particularly reassuring. You say this is not a quantum jump. This is a sub-lineage of Omicron, which we have experienced before, we've been infected by before, and presumably we have considerable immunities to as well. Let's then, at this point and against this background, come to some of the details. The first thing people want to know is, is JN.1 more infectious than the COVID strains? I assume since it's a sub-lineage of Omicron that it will be no more infectious than the earlier sub-lineages, or is that mistaken? Well, what we know is that uh, it has an additional mutation in the BA 2.86 lineage, which makes JN1 little more infectious, little more transmittable, uh, and able to evade uh, pre-existing antibodies. That's what we know. So yes, it's it's a bit more infectious, but again, I wouldn't say that it's drastically going to change the scenario. So this little bit more infectious is not worryingly more infectious? No, uh, not at this point in time. What are the symptoms of illness that JN.1 produces and is the sickness that will emerge more severe than the sickness caused by the earlier strains of Omicron? There is no evidence so far that it causes illness that is more severe than, uh, you know, the, the severe disease is caused a lot by existing comorbidities, by how our own immune system reacts to the virus, this virus, any virus. Uh, and, and considering that we have had a lot of infection already, a lot of vaccination, um, I don't think this is going to cause disease that's more severe. But having said that, people who have comorbidities need to, it, it would be prudent to shelter themselves, be sensible. Rather than panicking, be sensible, shelter yourself if possible, wear a mask if possible, all of that. Okay, so we don't have evidence of more severe illness compared to the no. illness caused by earlier strains of Omicron, but your no. advice to those with comorbidities, and I presume your advice to the elderly, is play it safe. Wear a mask Absolutely. in crowded places, do not take risks you don't need to take. Absolutely. And I would say that same thing for flu as well. Flu is far more dangerous to elderly over the years than, than we've seen COVID in the last few years. Now, that's very reassuring again. Flu is far more dangerous than even JN.1. Yes. Yes. That's what we've seen. I mean, most people don't get vaccinated for flu. Most people have been vaccinated against COVID. Uh, so that, that's what makes the difference. Tell me, Professor Jamil, how does JN.1 respond to the COVID vaccinations we have? And I guess there are two questions inherent in that initial question. First of all, how does it respond to the new updated vaccinations which are being used in the West? They are not available to us in India. I will add that in case the audience thinks they're available. And secondly, how does it respond to the vaccinations we in India have had, which are mainly, if not preponderantly, Covishield and Covaxin? But it's too early to say how it reacts to the updated vaccines. Firstly, updated vaccines are not available in large numbers, and JN1 hasn't really been around that much. But the there is evidence that the updated vaccines, which were based on Omicron strains in the UK and, and elsewhere, people have been given dual vaccines as a booster, which simply means that the vaccine has two kinds of uh, strains in it, one the parental strain, the other the Omicron, as opposed to a single vaccine, which is the parental strain. And whatever studies have are available from Europe, there isn't much difference in the protection one gets with the updated vaccines, maybe a little bit more, but nothing significantly more 
compared to just the parental vaccine. So vaccines that are available in India are just fine. So people uh, who have had Covishield and Covaxin, and by now most people should have had not just the two regular vaccinations, but also the booster, they would be in the category of fine. Yes, uh, they would be. Having said that, I mean, I have said this earlier as well, that the I don't understand the boosting policy in our country. Uh, we don't have RNA vaccines. That's fine. But we have two protein vaccines, which are licensed in India. Uh, we're not using them as much as we should be uh, in, in boosting. Uh, we are from all the principles of immunology that we understand, heterologous vaccination, heterologous boosting strategy is always better. And data is available on that. The large Southampton study about which I've written, about which I've talked on your show and, and elsewhere, uh, says very clearly that if you have taken two doses of Covishield and you boost it with a protein vaccine, that's better than boosting with the third dose of Covishield. And I'm simply picking up Covishield because majority of vaccines in India uh, are Covishield. So I think we should change our strategy or our advice instead of letting people decide what they want to take. Quite right. Let me ask you this. The last time someone of my age, and I'm using myself only as an example, nothing more as an illustration, had the booster, was it January 2022? That is almost two years ago. I've had COVID as well. And there are many like me who've been fully vaccinated and have also had COVID. Do such people need another booster at this point when JN.1 is becoming a matter of caution, as you said, maybe not of over concern? Or do you think we have sufficient immunity from earlier vaccines and from earlier exposures to the virus not to require a booster? Which of the two? Well, I'm somebody who is driven by data. And unfortunately, data is horribly bad in India as far as this question is concerned. The last zero survey we had was in April 2020 or July 2021. The last vaccines, you know, in quantity that have been delivered in India are towards the end of 2022, early 2023, which means that most of us, just like you said about yourself, haven't had anything for over a year. People who have not had a booster probably had, you know, their two shots about two years ago or 18 months ago. And data from elsewhere clearly shows that anti-infection immunity lasts only about four months. Immunity to severe disease lasts much longer. For India, we don't know, for example, at this point, what percent of our population has antibodies to the COVID vaccine or to the, to the spike protein of, of the virus. We have no idea. We are flying blind. So why isn't the ICMR Ministry of Health doing something? Just do a cross-sectional survey. People who come to blood banks to donate blood, just look at what fraction of them have antibodies. It's not that difficult to do. We have the setup. We have the people. We I should mean, do that. I would presume, or maybe I should say, I would hope, that some of what you're saying they are doing and that even though they've not gone public, these cross-sectional surveys are happening, happening quietly, perhaps, but happening nonetheless. But in the meantime, what is your hunch? And I suppose the word hunch is the correct one. Should the Indian government make boosters available at least to the medically vulnerable as well as the elderly? The so boosters are available. It's just that boosters are not available free of cost. So you can book a booster and there are multiple vaccines that are available in India as boosters. So I think what is needed is the right advice on what sort of boosters people should be taking. If, for example, you've had two COVID shields having, or three COVID shields, having a fourth COVID shield is not going to be better. It might actually be a little problematic. Uh, 
So one is the right kind of advice. The other is, you know, people who are more vulnerable, uh, those with comorbidities, uh, elderly. Yes, I feel that they should be getting boosters, uh, not not just because of JN1, but because every winter this thing will keep happening. Uh, so, you know, boosting is necessary to just boost up your immunity. It will protect for a while against infection, but it will pro protect much longer against severe disease, hospitalization, uh, and mortality. So what you're saying, Professor Jamil, is that, first of all, if you can afford to pay for a booster, because the government is not giving boosters free, if you can afford to pay for a booster, and you are also in that category of being either medically vulnerable or elderly, it might be wise to take a heterologous booster, i.e. a different one to the original vaccinations that you took, perhaps a protein one if you took Covaxin or Covishield. And secondly, you're also saying that for the elderly and for the vulnerable, particularly because this is winter, this might be a sensible precaution to take. Have I summed you up correctly? Yes, pretty much uh, the same. And I might also add that we are not talking about something that adds to this problem every winter, and that is the air pollution in our cities and villages, uh, especially in North India. Uh, it's, it's very well known that air pollution reduces immunity, air produce, pollution worsens lung disease. Uh, so we have an additional factor to worry about, and, and, and that's why it's important to uh, you know get all the protection you can, whether it's through vaccines or it is through protecting yourself with masks, sheltering, any of that. So because this is winter and it's cold and also because air pollution is a particular concern in northern India and in Delhi to be specific, your advice to the elderly and for the vulnerable, it makes sense, assuming they can afford it, to take a booster. Do you have any sense of how much those boosters cost? That will be a question that arises in many people's <laughs> minds. Are we talking about hundreds of rupees, thousands of rupees? I think there are hundreds of rupees. Uh, probably the most expensive one would be in the range of about a thousand to twelve hundred. I haven't looked at the prices, but uh, and, and, and it also depends whether you're taking at a government hospital or in a private hospital. And you're suggesting a heterologous booster, which is different to the two vaccines you took. <clears throat> a protein one, in fact, if you took Covaxin and Covishield, have I got that right as well? Well, if you've taken Covaxin, you can take another Covaxin. There's nothing that will interfere. But certainly if you've taken Covishield, then you must not take a fourth dose of Covishield. Uh, take a protein booster. But I, I think can it's... You, it's can an, you name the protein boosters for the audience who may not remember? Well, it's, uh, it's Covovax and Corbivax. There Covovax are two available in... And, Corby, or, and Corbivax. Yeah, Covovax is made by um, Serum Institute. And Corbivax is made by, um, I forget the name of the company in Hyderabad, but yeah. But the names are very good. Those are important for people to have. Singapore, yeah. I notice, has introduced a mask mandate in crowded places. They did that a couple of days ago. Karnataka also a couple of days ago has introduced a mask mandate, but it seems to be limited for the elderly. I don't think they've defined what they mean by the word elderly. Would you advise that sort of mandate to be followed more widely in India, both in crowded places and for the elderly? Well, it's been shown in studies that mask mandates don't work. That doesn't mean that masks don't mm -hmm. work. Masks work. But when you're talking about a mandate, yes, people will wear a mask because you know, a policeman is going to catch them and, and, you know, they'll be fined. But they'll not be wearing their mask properly. And we've seen this in the peak of COVID in India, that, you know, either the nose is open or the mask is simply hanging on the chin. We've seen all of that. So I would say instead of having a mask mandate, it's important to educate people why masks are important, why masks are useful. And it's why it is sensible to wear masks in public places, in crowded buses, metros, 
you know so you know it works in a country like singapore where you know the public interest and uh, you know compliance is is much more i don't think it it will work in in our country it certainly hasn't worked in much of europe and us but what um, you're saying the is not a mandate because mandates are enforced and that puts people's backs up and they usually defy right. but make it known as advice educate people to the reason that it is necessary to follow it right. and give it then to their good sense to abide by the advice right right now the business standard on the 20th that's yesterday says that at the moment and i'm quoting the paper the laboratory network in sakog and if i recall correctly you used to be head of insacog briefly is not operating at the level it should a does that sound correct to you b if it's correct does it worry you and c if it is correct what should it be doing what should insacog be doing to function better well uh, the insacog portal has recently moved uh, and i i looked at it is is nice it's very nice it's beautifully represented but you don't get a sense of how many samples were tested uh, so i have i have used my sources to find out how many samples were tested in in india to come to this conclusion that jn1 is increasing so the data on the portal shows that uh, you know in november there was 33% jn1 in december it was 89% jn1 now when you talk about percentages numbers become important how many were tested if hundreds were tested then these numbers are more robust so what i found out was that 14 samples were tested in november out of which four were jn1 18 samples were tested in january and out of that 16 were jn1 so certainly jn1 is increasing but if we tested larger numbers we would get a better picture now what it also doesn't say is what types of samples were tested are these samples from more severe disease are these samples from one location so for example goa showed 18 positive cases where in goa were these samples from were they from one hotel by the beach or were were they from all over goa those details become very important so what i'm trying to say is that yes i i think this apprehension that enough samples are not being tested uh, seems to be correct percentages don't mean much numbers mean that's the first point the 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 second point is that wastewater surveillance has come up with to be a fairly reliable method of figuring out what's going on in the community and one place where and and by the way insacog portal also says that they are doing wastewater surveillance you can go to the portal and register yourself as a wastewater survey site and they'll give you access and all of that so that's all that's all very nice one place where wastewater surveillance is working very well is in the city of bangalore and they have been tracking this and in the wastewater of bangalore from november onwards jn1 is going up that data is available with the tata institute for genetics and society in bangalore however we you know regular testing in bangalore hasn't really happened after around the first week of november so there is a mismatch what wastewater surveillance has shown is that you could tell up to 2 weeks 3 weeks in advance what's going to break out in the population it's a wonderful way to alert ourselves and unfortunately we are not using it as much as we should be using it so you know i think these are strategies we have learned a lot during covid we need to remember those lessons and we need to apply these in real time 
which I feel is not happening as much as it should. If I understand you correctly, Professor Jamil, you're saying that INSACOG is not revealing some of the information and details it has. I'm not saying it doesn't have the details, but it's not making them easily accessible on the portal. And secondly, perhaps wastewater surveillance isn't happening as effectively and as comprehensively as it should. I get the feeling you're not completely, totally satisfied with the way INSACOG is responding at the moment. Am I correct in that feeling? Well, let me just say that the public facing information that INSACOG is providing is not adequate for independent researchers, independent observers to make much out of it. Yes, I know that JN1 is going up, but as I said earlier, percentages don't mean anything, numbers do. Only 20 confirmed JN1 cases are there in India at this point. In other words, the information that should be available from the INSACOG portal for independent researchers is not available or at least not easily accessible. Not accessible. If you just look at their portal, it's not accessible. Which is a hindrance for people who are independent researchers. They are being held back. Well, this, is, this has been the story of COVID in India. So it hasn't changed with experience, even though we've had three years of experience. It hasn't changed. Maybe, maybe it suits everyone and maybe that's why it hasn't changed. Yes, it's very much part of the Indian system to deny the Indian people what is their right to know. But leave that aside. That's more political than scientific for today's discussion. Now, the health secretary has written to all states to ramp up testing and he's also ordered mock drills every three months. I'm not sure why every three months when the concern is a concern of the moment. A, are you happy with this ordering of mock drills every three months when the concern is a concern of the moment? And secondly, beyond ramping up testing and ordering these mock drills, what more should the government do to be sure that they are prepared? Well, I would give the health minister the benefit of doubt and say it's a good thing that, uh, you know, mock drills will happen. Uh, assess your health care system today. Uh, if, for example, in the next two weeks, 10,000 cases show up, what will you do? How will you do it? And if those 10,000 cases happen in one location, how will you do it? Uh, so, you know, those sorts of assessments, I'm sure, are happening and should happen. Mock drills every three months or every six months or every two months, you know, it's a matter of, uh, matter of opinion. Mock drills such as that should always happen in any good healthcare system to ensure that the system is battle ready. I'm sorry, I, I should not be using war as a, as a corollary to, to this, but this is essentially what it is. We're not done yet with COVID. We're not done with flu. We're not done with air pollution. Uh, there is a lot on our plate right now. Is there a sense in which after the infection numbers came down fairly rapidly post April, May of this year, that a certain complacency set in and we may have dropped our guard and therefore our sense of preparedness today when there are surges beginning is not as good as it should be? Well, that's a sense of complacency sets in everywhere. That's human nature. Uh, if something is not threatening me, I forget about it. Uh, and it, it's it's surprising how much we have forgotten what happened two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, yes, we should we should forget it for our mental health, for our, our well being, but we should not forget it for the lessons that it taught us. Because and if we did that, it will not be right. Yeah, and we're in danger of doing the latter. We're forgetting the lessons. Uh, yes. I mean, in, in this country, in the UK, there's a commission, for example, that's looking at the government response to COVID. Quite uh, right. And it has Boris uh, it's a, serious trouble from what I had to gather from the papers. Nothing of the sort has happened in India. There was no commission in India to look into, to inquire about the manner in which COVID was handled. We gave ourselves an enormous pat on the back. The prime minister was amongst the first to do it. But no scientific commission actually evaluated the Indian response. Should that have happened? Well, any mature 
system will look at itself uh, in prospect and take lessons. And I believe India should be doing it as a mature democracy, as some someone as as a country that wants to be uh, a leader on the world stage. We should be doing it. We should introspect. Vishwa gurus, as we claim, should be doing this. Well, <laughs> my last question. And it's a question that will arise to the audience because they are now beginning to pay attention to COVID, to articles in the papers about COVID, to discussions on television about COVID. Newspaper reports suggest, and I'm talking about the business standard of the 20th, that is yesterday, that of the nearly 2,311 cases in the country of overall COVID, something like 1749 are in Kerala alone, where we have also had, I believe, four deaths, not from JN.1, but from all different types of COVID. What is the best explanation for the high incidence of COVID in Kerala? Well, it's an observational bias. If you look for it, you'll find it. If you don't look for it, you won't find it. Kerala has a healthcare system that actively looks for it, tests for it, tracks it, other places don't. That's that's the simple explanation. There's no reason why something like this will happen in Kerala and not elsewhere. And, you know, as I said, INSACOG data shows 18 cases of JN1 came from Goa. One came from Maharashtra and one came from uh, Kerala. That's what INSACOG data currently shows. You're making a very important point. The reason why it seems on paper, and I'm underlining that phrase, the reason why it seems on paper that Kerala has a higher incidence of COVID than any other state is because Kerala does more testing, better testing, and more honestly reveals what the tests show. It's not that other states will not have as many or perhaps even more cases. It's just that they don't do the testing, and as a result, they don't know. Kerala is therefore looking as if it's getting a bad name only because actually it's doing its job so much better than any other state. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think other states need to take a lesson from, from that. Rather than be frightened by Kerala, we should emulate Kerala. Is that right? Well, that's what uh, the system shows. Professor Jamil, thank you very much. And I repeat once again something that you said, because I think it's the most important message to the audience who are beginning to get a little worried about COVID once again. This is not, you said at the beginning of the interview, a matter of concern, but it is a matter of caution. Don't get overly anxious because it has the same systems in place, we are ready to do it, provided we act fast, we act efficiently, and we act reasonably promptly. Thank you very much indeed. I'm deeply grateful to you. Thank you, Karan. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.